and the town of Cana in the New Testament. Amen. And the first, of course, is in John 21 and 2, said that Nathanael was of Cana. Nathanael was from the town of Cana of Galilee. And we read about Nathanael in the first chapter of John. One verse would be enough to mention him in verse 47. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and saith of him, Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. I like that, don't you? Wouldn't you like to have God say that about you? It's not an easy thing to have him say it because there wasn't a man in the Bible that was ever listed as being without guile except Nathaniel. The only one in the Bible who was guileless, Nathaniel of Cana. I'm wondering about this town of Cana. You see, the Old Testament Canaan is the derivative word, the root word of the New Testament Cana. Is that right? And this is because the Old Testament rendering into English came out of the Hebrew language. And the Old King James called many things a little different in the Old as the uh, English translation came out of the Greek in the New Testament. For instance, Isaiah in the Old Testament is Isaiah of the New Testament. Jonah of the Old Testament is Jonas of the New Testament. It's the same person, the same man, the same name, but each rendering came from a different language. And that's how it wound up in Old King James's English. Amen. Praise the Lord. And here is Elijah in the New Testament. He's called Elias. Hmm? And in the Old Testament, there's this Joshua who is referred to in the book of Hebrews as Jesus, if you please. Meaning the Lord is salvation. Salvation is of the Lord. So I'm saying that Canaan and Cana were much the same. Although Canaan was the entire country, it was typified by the town of Cana in the New Testament. Let us go on. The next verse is chapter 2 of John, verse 1. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. Sounds good, don't it? Now the third time that the New Testament refers to uh, Cana, we look in the fourth chapter of John, and there in verse 46, so Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee. Aren't you glad he's coming again? You really believe he's coming again? <laughs> Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee where he made the water wine. That was his first miracle, the turning of the water into wine, right? Now, and there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. This, when he healed the nobleman's son, was the second miracle that Jesus ever did. Let me refresh you by a few names tonight. A few names of the land of Canaan. It is called in Isaiah 62, Beulah, Beulah land. It's called, of course, by its name Canaan. Then it's called in Zechariah, the Holy Land. Isaiah 8.8 8 said it's Emmanuel's land. Genesis 40, verse 15, said it's the land of the Hebrews. Canaan was the land of the Hebrew. Acts 10.39 said it was the land of the Jews. Hebrews 11.9 said it's the land of promise. Exodus 15, 14 said it's Palestinian. Daniel 8, 9 said it was the pleasant land. And Hosea 9 and 3 said it's the Lord's land. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord, help us tonight to prepare while yet in Canaan for the greatest Canaan land of all, the holy city. It's in process of being prepared for us even now. Lord, may we pass the test 
May we survive probation period on earth. May we come through this life as an overcomer. May we rise to greet thee. May we all here tonight go to meet thee. In our Father's house there are many mansions, and if it weren't so, you wouldn't have told us, but you did tell us it must be so. And I'm prone to believe it tonight. Lord, not only a mansion, a robe, and a crown, and unto whom you give much, you expect much, and if he succeed, shall be rewarded with a great reward. And unto whom you give much, and they uh, fail, then they should be beaten of many stripes. And if to whom you give little, and they fail, they shall be beaten with few stripes. I know there's variance of reward in heaven. There's variances of flame and heat and torment in hell. But God, we're here tonight to improve ourselves and to climb a little higher on Jacob's ladder. Even now, prepare us in this land for the land that is to come. In Jesus' name, amen. How many would rather be here than the best hospital in Tampa? How about the best convalescent home, convalescing any place tonight? Well, let's see. How about the best jailhouse in Hillsboro? Hmm. And how about the best insane asylum in Chattahoochee or Arcadia? I have not lost my mind. I still have the mind of Christ. The only time I lost my mind is when I got saved, and that's when I got his mind. And tonight his word lingers in my heart, and I want to take another look at the first time I heard of the Canaan's land. When the spies returned from the Canaan's land, where the milk and honey flow. Some said we never could possess the land, but another said, let's go. Mm -hmm. We are able to go up and take the country and possess the land of Jordan to the sea. All the giants will be there our way to hinder, but God will surely give us victory. There were 12 spies and 10 came back and said, it can't be done. No, no, can't, can't don't, don't, won't, won't. They preached a negative gospel way back then. But two out of 12, that's one out of six of the preachers came back and said, if you don't lose your faith, rebuke your fear, and rise up and go right now, you can do anything. I don't care how big the giant is or how high the wall is or how fenced the cities are. It's true that Canaan's land is a land of Christian experience. It's true it's got high mountains and low valleys and the whole land got to be conquested, but it can be done. It can be done. Glory to God. Well, I'm happy. And now Joshua got the company together and said, Moses can't go, so I'll take his place. I'm a little bit afraid, but the Lord spoke to me last night and said that as I was with Moses, so shall I be with you. And just as God was with anybody in the Bible, he can be with you right here tonight. He's no respecter of persons. And all these transactions happen only for our ensample that we would not also err therein. It happened for our admonition. So Joshua we got the people together and separated the company, and he sent the ark on ahead. And the priest stepped into the river, and the Jordan dried up. Not everybody could go too close to that ark but those that was called to do it he backed them off a mile and a half and said let the ark go over first we can't forget for a minute that that ark is as powerful as it ever was just because it wasn't underneath the curtains of the tabernacle didn't mean it lost one iota of its potency brother if you got too close and touched it you'd soon get zapped you'd soon find out how it was to die fast that right so there was a consecration. There was a little bit of a regarding here, an honor, a reverence, a recognition, a fearing of the Lord by letting the ark go first. And into Canaan's land, they passed. They divided the land by province and by lot according to the tribes. The day came when it became a kingdom under Saul, David, and Solomon. The day also came when Solomon's son rose up and said, my little fingers shall be thicker than my father's loins. If my father chastised you of whips, I will chastise you of scorpions. And someone said, who's this young upstart? 
to your tents, O Israel. What part do we have in David, or the son of Jesse? And the kingdom split, the congregation was divided. Yes, it was still Canaan's land. And it also went into Assyrian captivity. And the ten northern tribes of that northern kingdom have never been seen again until this generation. And Israel, the northern kingdom, has started filtering back since the year of 1948. Israel's been a nation. About a hundred years after that, Judah herself, the one tribe that was left and God was counting on, failed the Lord and was not qualified to stay in Canaan's land any longer. They wanted to stay. They walked around telling Jeremiah the weeping prophet they was going to stay. But Jeremiah just wagged his head and says, No, you're not. I'm wearing this yoke that God put around my neck, an actual yoke, saying in my prophecy, Go to Babylon and bear his yoke, and I'll spare you, saith God. There was a false prophet came along by the name of Hananiah and said, Thus saith the Lord, in two full years, God will deliver us from Babylon. Amen, said Jeremiah, who didn't really think about it at the time, because he really wanted to see God's best for God's people too. But he went on his way, the Bible said, and suddenly the real word of the Lord came on to Jeremiah, and he turned around and said, You prophesied a lie, Hananiah. You took the yoke off my neck and broke it, but that's not going to change one thing. You broke a yoke of wood, but I, saith the Lord, shall place upon you a yoke of iron which cannot be broken. And ye shall go to Babylon because ye don't qualify to stay in Jerusalem, in Canaan's land no more. And in 70 years, not two years, the wheels of God's ordinances grind slow, don't they? You may not meet your judgment that fast for every little thing you do but rest assured it'll catch up with you in the end eventually it will locate where you're at every chicken comes home to roost after a while the law of sowing and reaping cannot be disannulled say amen well i'm happy 70 years and then shall israel come back to canaan's land said jeremiah and you sir for prophesying a lie in the name of the lord is going to die this year. And Hananiah died that year. It was a, not a light thing to prophesy in the Old Testament. You had one chance to be right. And if you was wrong, brother, it was stones. I said it was truth or stones. Everybody say it with me. Truth or stones. How many's come to hear truth tonight? Thy word is truth. Hallelujah. Why, if we had that law enacted today in 1983 some of these folks running around saying god told me this and god told me that and god told me another thing which never actually happened or ever came to pass they'd quit saying it mighty fast if they knew they was going to get stoned for lying in the name of the lord say amen but uh, i couldn't help myself i had to stretch the truth a little and exaggerate preacher i was only lying for the glory of god Hello. Lying for the glory of God, huh? How interesting. What did Paul say? He said, if the truth of God abound through my life, why am I yet judged a sinner? Now, Paul said that, not this preacher. Say, praise the Lord. Now, there is a yoke by times that God will put on your neck. And Jeremiah had it from God to wear the yoke of wood concerning Babylon. You cannot always be free of a yoke. The Bible even tells us to not be on equally yoked together. It said don't, uh, didn't say not to be yoked, it said don't be on equally yoked. Isn't that right? Hallelujah. There is a yoke that God gives you, and his yoke is easy, and his burden is light. I have found it so. Oh, praise the Lord for the things that belong to her peace. So there is at by times a yoke that God gives you, a burden to carry, a cross to bear. In fact, they who are joined on to the Lord are one spirit. Isn't it right? But there are many other yokes that could be broken tonight, for the anointing can break the yoke. 
the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. And those are yokes of sin and yokes of infirmities and sicknesses and diseases and depressions and uh, mental anguish and suicides and cancers and everything else. There are yokes that can be broken, but if God ever put one on you, you're to bear it and you're to wear it. And the, the Hananiah, the prophet Hananiah, took the yoke off Jeremiah's neck. But it didn't do any good because God put that yoke on Jeremiah's neck. And just because he broke the yoke made out of wood, he could not break the next yoke made out of iron. So we must submit on to the will of God. Now why did they go to Babylon? Because they didn't qualify to stay in Canaan. Therefore, I submit to you, there is a place that God tolerates in your Christian experience. You may not deserve God's perfect will or His very best because of those things that have transpired in your life. Disobedience is a sin of witchcraft. Rebellion is a sin of witchcraft. Obedience is better than sacrifice. You see, there's the perfect will of God and then there is the permissive will of God. Am I right? Some said, you mean God's got three or four different wills? Not exactly, but there's God's best for your life. And then there's the place that God puts up with, with you in your life. It's not his best. He has better things for you. You have not received them. You don't live in that area yet. And he tolerates it. At least he doesn't forsake you. He stays with you. He said, I'll stay with you in Babylon, and in 70 years I'll bring you back again. Oh, that we might learn to seek the Lord early, while it is yet called day, rising early and finding him. We shall find him when we seek for him with all our heart. One old fellow stood up and testified and said, Brother Freddy, I gave my life to God tonight. And I said, what life? You've spent your life. You're old and gray-headed and your life is gone. Now, if you were a child or a, a youth and stood up and said, I received Jesus, I've got salvation tonight, and you remember your Creator in the days of your youth, when the evil day comes not, nor the year draws nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them, then you can truthfully say, I am giving my life to God because my life is still ahead of me. It's appointed on a man once to die, and after death the judgment. We are promised three score and ten, that's seventy years, and they'll go by so fast that you won't realize what's hitting you. And if by reason of strength, the psalmist said you live to be eighty, your days will be full of trouble and sorrow. Amen. Now, before the flood, Methuselah, Methuselah lived 969. That's almost a thousand years old. From the days of uh, uh, Babel, the Tower of Babel in those days, before that Holocaust, they were living to be about 120. In fact, Moses, even in the dispensation of the law, managed to live 120. And his natural force was not abated, and his eye was not weak nor dim. But listen, who would want to live forever in this carcass? I mean, that backache, you want to suffer that old backache throughout all eternity? If I'm going to have to live forever, I want a good house to live in if I'm going to have to live forever. That men are getting weaker and wiser. And this, from the days of David, who prophesied this, until now, man's lifespan is 70 years, and you can't get around the book. Are you listening to me? Now, don't you want to give your life or what's left of your life to God tonight as fast as possible? For only one life will soon be passed and only what's done for Christ will last. Amen. Now, they went to Babylon and they had to leave Canaan's land. They went, I submit to you, they went to the permissive will of God, the place that God allowed, tolerated, and put up with, but it wasn't his best. He did not forsake them. He brought them back to Jerusalem, eventually to Canaan's land once more. Last night we preached on the book of Malachi, how that he prophesied and told the people exactly what God thought about them. And they justified themselves. And they wiggled and squirmed off the hook. And the theme to me of the book of Malachi is, ye say, but ye say. But I say one thing, saith God, and ye say another thing. And if you read it, there's at least a couple of dozen times 
that Israel said, but ye say. They had their own opinions, their own ideas. They did what they felt like doing. In the days of the judges, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. But there's a book to go by. Then said I, Lo, I come, and the volume of the book it is written of me, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Well, they should have listened to Malachi a little more closely because when he got done prophesying, it went quiet in heaven for 400 years. After silence, nobody got a prayer through, nobody heard a prophecy, never was there a thus way of the Lord. Why, some of you can't stand it for uh, four days without hearing from God. But between the Old Testament ending with Malachi and the New Testament starting with Matthew was 400 years where God never said one thing. Brother, I'm wondering what's happened to Canaan's land tonight. Let's see. Matthew starts off with an angel showing up, talking onto Elizabeth. Then he went and spoke to Mary, and Elizabeth bore John the Baptist, and Mary bore the Christ child, Jesus. And when... Mary came to visit Elizabeth there in the sixth month. She embraced her cousin Elizabeth and the babe, yet unborn, six months, two pounds, mouth not even formed yet, leaped in her womb for joy, and Jesus said that John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. Because he had no mouth to prophesy with, his mother started prophesying, and Elizabeth prophesied. Hallelujah. Jesus went on to say that from the days of John the Baptist, the days of John the Baptist? Yes, from the days he was first formed in the womb, when he was filled with the Holy Ghost in the womb, when he leaped and jumped for joy in the womb. From those days, that very hour, the kingdom of heaven suffer violence, and the violent take it by force. If you've not been taking things in the kingdom, taking forts, taking giant strides, accomplishing things in God, I suggest you get a little bit more violent tonight. Instead of being a panty waist and a, a pasty face and a, a sitting there weak kneed and mealy mouthed and wishy washy and all watered down and compromising. Beating around the bush and running around Robin Hood's barn with no, not enough power to blow mosquitoes' brains out. When Paul preached the gospel, he preached it in the power and in the demonstration of the Holy Ghost. He said there's no other gospel. If an angel from heaven preach it different, let him be accursed. If I come next year preaching it different than I preached it this year, don't even listen to me. He said, why? The only gospel is the one that can be proven. The one that can be backed up and demonstrate when you get all done your talking, you can show people that what you're talking about will work and it's real after all. Hallelujah. 400 years had gone by in quietness. There wasn't a breath on the water. Suddenly, a little baby got filled with the Holy Ghost while in the womb and jumped for joy, and the kingdom of God started shaking, suffering violence. And brother, if God's kingdom is a shaking, you can bet your boots the devil's kingdom has just about had it. I said when the collision course arrives and there's a head-on impact, the devil always winds up with the brunt and the worst of it. Now, one of the devil's shaking. His knees are shaking together outside those doors tonight, scared to death of what God's going to do in this meeting. While some folks are just complacently drifting on, not knowing that the kingdom of heaven is suffering violence. And if you get anything out of the kingdom tonight, you're going to have to get a little bit more violent than you've been. Hello. Not everybody nodding at you is agreeing with you. Wake up. Rise and shine, O church. Your light has come. Hallelujah. That knowing the time, it's a high time to rise out of sleep. Now is your salvation nearer than when you first believed. Do you believe that? Glory to God. So the kingdom of heaven has been suffering violence and shaking for 2,000 years. Aren't you glad for it? Hallelujah to God. Now, here is John, the fourth and final gospel, before the acts of the apostles are poured out. John said that a certain man lived in Cana. Oh, thank God for Canaan. How many is going to go to Canaan's land? 
How many's already living in Canaan land? Did you know that when they purged the land of Canaan from the Hittites and the Hevites and the Amorites and the Edomites and the Moabites and the Jebusites and the termites and the parasites and all the ites. There was one group they couldn't move. They, of course, were the original Canaanites. Wouldn't you know it? And God said, you children of Israel, you've done a pretty good job, but what you can't handle, I'll take over. You know that God can only do for you what you can't do for yourself. It's not that he can't, he won't. He doesn't want lazy Christians sitting around in the kitchen saying, Lord, I'm thirsty, go to the refrigerator and get me a glass of water. Get up, get your own glass of water, and someday God will do something for you that you can't do for yourself. We are workers together with Christ. Heirs of God and joint heirs of Christ, co-partners, equally yoked. Hello, wondering why the preacher bends his ear all night. He's listening for a response. Amen. Oh, me or oh, my, one of them will fit you. Don't forget the microphone is portable. We can pick out the quiet spot and come down there and preach. So keep on responding. If you don't want somebody walking down there preaching at you. Hallelujah. I love him. The Lord said, you've done all you can. If you can't move the Canaanites, you've done a good job. I'll take care of what you can't do. So the Lord did a very strange thing. He sent the hornets after the Canaanites. Did he do it? And when those old hornets started zap, stinging them, you know, those Canaanites jumped up and got more than willing to move. I mean, they left on the run. They wasn't hesitating for anything because what Israel couldn't do, God did in a very small, simple way. Don't underestimate this God that I'm serving. You don't want to serve him? He'll figure out a way to get you to. I ask you a question. Were the Canaanites leaving against their will? How many believes that they were willing to go? Would you be willing to move if hornets were stinging you? Would you be willing? I don't know why. He may have to slap you on your back in a hospital room, but if it takes that, he'll do that. After all, some little grandmama got in the closet several years ago now and prayed, oh God, save my children. Save my children. If it takes my life, save my children. And if it happened. It took her life. She died and went on the glory. And some of the children's not saved yet, but some of them are. And some of them are going to, all of them are going to be if Grandma ever prayed. I'm telling you, when God gets on your trail, there's no escaping. Once it's decreed, once the great share of heaven starts in on you, you can come easy or you can come the hard way. It don't make no difference to God. Hallelujah. We used to have an old bull back on the farm. He was the stubbornest thing that I ever saw on that farm. All the years, there was no bull so stubborn. I still see my grandfather. He had a great big ring in the bull's nose, and they had him tied to the back of the old farm truck. And they put the old farm truck down in bull low. And when that thing got in gear, and many sizes bigger than that bull, and it took off, and that chain tightened up. There on the snout of that bull, the most sensitive part of his anatomy, that ring threatened to rip out his nose. And he snorted and bellowed and hated it. And he drug his feet and his hooks. And he drug for several feet before he couldn't take the pain no more. And finally he got up on all fours and lumbered along. He didn't like it, but he had to go along with it. <laughs> Say hallelujah. I said, some of you may not like it, but you're going to have to go along with it. When the hornet gets on your trail, you're going to get willing to move. And when Grandma prayed, her prayers were going to be answered. Maybe not yet, but someday they will be. And until they are, you're going to have a hard road to hoe. Brother, I believe there's an easy way to obey God. 
the Holy Spirit has come to lead us and teach us and guide us into all truth. If you want to kick against the pricks, Saul, you'll find it's a hard thing to kick against the pricks. You might just as well come along easy. I remember when old uh, Gideon was faint yet pursuing. You remember? Hallelujah. Oh, glory. He had won the great battle of the Midianites, but now he was picking up the stragglers and the roots, the two kings who would come back next year of another army. You know, you're going to dig out the root. Don't cut off the branches. He chased those kings till he caught him, and on the way he asked some people from one town, said, Hey, uh, would you give me some, something to eat so I can chase the devil for you? Hmm. Sorry, said the men of Shechem, if you, have, uh, you haven't got the kings, you're not going to get any bread from us. And that just like some people. You couldn't get them to invest in the work of God for nothing. You couldn't convince them before the fact for anything until healings and miracles and signs and wonders and supernatural happenings starts dropping all around them and they never get interested in supporting the work of God. There are people here tonight that would give a whole lot better after they was healed. Hello, than they ever would before it ever, the healing ever came. That, friend, is a fact. When you've got a miracle, it's a fact. Then how about faith? Faith is not fact. Faith is before the fact. Why do we always put God to the test? Why do we always make him prove himself? And when he comes through and does it all, then we nod a professional amen of approval. Yes, now we can endorse you, brother. Now we can say a professional amen to your brother. Now we can stand with you after you've proven it. God says, believe me and I'll prove it to you. But people say, prove it to me and I'll believe you. How many is getting this? I'm covering some material a little fast. I don't like to go quite this fast, but are you absorbing? Hallelujah. I love him, don't you? So tonight, let us not get faith mixed up with facts. Someone said, yeah, I would like to have a, a miracle because I don't have time to wait for a healing. A miracle is an instant work of God, you see, and healing is a gradual and progressive work of God. Now, many of you will receive miracles tonight. I know that in my bones simply because you have persevered, you have come, put forth the effort to attend, and even now you are attending to the Word. I hope you are attending uh, attentively. And you will, will receive miracles. But some of you may receive only the beginning of the miracle, and the gradual progressive restoration comes under the ninth gift of the Spirit called the gift of healing. Now, if you're not in too big a rush, God would like to give you a healing tonight. A lot of you. Am I right? And why would God rather give some of you healing? Because a miracle can only be appreciated. Only healing can build your faith. Whenever you get anything too quick, you don't have time for faith to grow. Healing takes time, and all the time you're believing, exercising faith, Lord, perfect it, continue it, he that hath begun a good work in me, uh, perform it unto the day of Jesus, and when you finally get the finished product, your faith has grown. It took time, and it took exercise, but your faith grew. There's no chance for your faith to grow very much when God instantly gives you something that can only be appreciated. Now, are you listening? Uh, glory, or oh, Canaan's land. Here's Nathaniel from Cana, underneath a fig tree. Philip comes and finds him and says, We have found the Messiah. Who? The Messiah. Oh, Cana is getting on my brain, you know, cobwebs on the brain and rust in the soul and the stool of do nothing and lethargy and uh, pacification. Why, quit ye like men tonight and stir yourself. Don't you know you've got to get more violent if you're going to take anything out of this kingdom? Get anything out of this meeting? Get anything from the spirit world? It's going to take a strong effort. Mm. I don't believe it. 
said Nathaniel. Well, don't jump the gun and judge before the time. At least come and check it out. I admire Nathaniel of Cana. For one thing, he went and checked out the story. He didn't take it third-handed. He didn't take it by way of the grapevine. He didn't say, hey, you know, um, I heard this preachers at New Testament church and blah, 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 and so forth and so on. Well, I just guess I'll stay home. Well, you old hypocrite. You come out and check it out. I don't mind you checking this out. God will make a believer out of you tonight before this meeting's over with. Hallelujah. Yes, he will. If you're not one, he'll send a few hornets and make a believer out of you. Hallelujah. At least you checked it out for yourself. Now, there's a lot of folks here tonight that's come to check the preacher out. I know that. What they don't know is that God brought them down here to check them out. Say amen. Go ahead and say amen. Nathaniel at least had honest doubt. He had honest doubt. You know what dishonest doubt is like? Hey, I know I've been healed. I know I ought to go to church because God saved me. I, I seen signs and wonders, miracle after miracle, and I just refuse to believe God. Now that's dishonest doubt. But honest doubt says, well, I heard about it, but I'm not going to take nobody's word for it. I'm going to go check it out myself. And Jesus saw him coming and said, Behold, an Israelite from Cana. Woo, for a, a dweller in Canaan's land, but more than this, in whom there's no guile. Oh, that we could get rid of the dross and the guile and the, the sin and the trespass and all the cloudy gray areas, hmm? compromising uh, areas of a life. No guile. No ulterior motive, no axe to grind, no special interest group, no double, triple, and four and five reasons why you've got to do something for God. Nobody being bribed with great prosperity packages. Say amen. But simply because you love him, come just as you are, and he will see something in you that you can't see in yourself. How do you know me? I knew you, Nathaniel, when you was beneath the fig tree. Somebody preached a sermon one time on what in the world could Nathaniel have been doing underneath that fig tree. Well, I'll tell you what he wasn't doing. That's he wasn't doing anything that had any guile to it. Hello. I'm willing to give some of you people the benefit of the doubt tonight. I don't have to go witch hunting and snooping under every stone to find out every secret about you. There's lots of things that you've done. I don't ever want to know it. Amen. But what I want to know at this present moment is if you've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And if you have, the past is canceled and that book is open. There's a white blank page for February the 4th, 1983. God can't even remember what you've done once it's buried in the deepest sea of God's forgetfulness. All oh, those sins be as scarlet, they should be white as snow. Red like crimson, they should be as wool. It's buried, brother. This is no cover up in Watergate. This thing is buried forever. Say so, amen. Aren't you happy? Blessed be the Lord. An Israelite indeed in whom there is no guile. What was he doing underneath the fig tree? Whatever it was, it didn't have any guile to it. He must have been praying. He must have been shouting. I mean, Jesus gave him every benefit of the doubt. He must have been making good use of his time. He must have been spiritual. He must have been doing something positive because there was no guile in this Canaanite. How many like to be a Canaanite tonight? Not the kind that the hornets get after and sting all the pieces, but the kind that's got no guile in you. Say hallelujah. There's two kinds of Canaanites. There's two classes of people in this world tonight, and that's the saved and the unsaved, though they're both on this planet. I don't hold my head down when uh, the world looks at me. It wouldn't even be raining today and yesterday if it weren't for me. He makes his rain to fall upon the just and the unjust, but not because of the unjust. Church still here. Then the salt of the earth still got its savor and it's stinging out all the rottenness that keeps healing from coming. Hallelujah. The sun wouldn't shine if it wasn't for you and me. He makes his sun to shine upon the evil and the good. It's not because of the evil. Thank God, thank God. 
if you don't believe I'm telling you the truth, you wait till great tribulation comes and you'll find out how much the sun's going to shine. I said, when you check and find the church is gone, there'll be blackness and darkness on the seat of the beast where they gnaw their tongues with pain and can't see the hand in front of their face. God's people's gone, and the light is gone with them. Say hallelujah. Oh, blessed be God. Are you getting ready to go up in the great getting up morning? The first resurrection on such, the second death has no power. Wait till you see what's going to rain in this time of Jacob's trouble. This holocaust the world's never seen. Going to rain plagues, vials, seals, trumpets, judgments. Many plagues are raining from heaven. I thank God for the rain we had. We needed it. Was it day before yesterday it rained? Oh, it was a good soaking. How many wants it to rain right through this roof right tonight? Tampa walked around saying, well, you know, we still must be God's pick of the litter because we didn't lose the citrus crop. My lawn's turning green again. We got the rain finally. What they forgot to say was they wouldn't have got nothing if it wasn't for us. I said they wouldn't have had a drop if it wasn't for the saints. I'm so sick and tired of these leeches riding on my coattail dragging all the benefits and the blessings out of me that they don't even deserve. Brothers, I don't hang my head down around them. I hold it up. I'm a child of the king. God only blesses this earth because his bride's still here. He take good care of his bride. Say hallelujah. He don't want nothing to happen to her. Aren't you happy? Oh, she might be tested and tried a few times. She might even have a little tribulation. In the world you shall endure tribulation, and be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. With great tribulation shall you enter into the kingdom of heaven. But the wrath of God abideth upon the children of disobedience. And you and I are not appointed unto wrath. There's a difference between tribulation and the wrath of God. Aren't you happy? Oh, glory. Behold an Israelite. He's a Canaanite. He lives in Canaan. But there's no guile in him. I don't see any hornet stinging him no place. He got everything in order. His house is in order. He's got everything uh, decent and in order. He's where he belongs. And I don't care what you criticize old Nathaniel about, what you gossip on him, underneath this fig tree, he's carrying on things that are without any guile. Oh, glory. Here came Jesus the first time to Cana, and he turned the water into wine. How many is going to that marriage? Why, when I sit down at that marriage supper table of the Lamb, it's going to make these $100 a plate Republican presidential campaign dinners look like a hot dog roast. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's just the first thing. Then I, number two, I'll go to the throne and receive my reward for the deeds done in the body called the judgment seat of Christ. That's the second thing after I get done being married to Jesus. Someone said, well, I hope I make the judgment seat of Christ, brother. Uh, if you get there, you've made it. I hope you won't turn me away and send me to hell. When you get to the judgment seat of Christ, you're already in heaven. You're already there. It's now a decision about what you're going to be in heaven as far as your reward's concerned. That'll be hinged particularly upon what you've done for Christ. The first thing the angel will ask you when you come out of your body, your soul leaves the body dead on the bed. The angel will take your hand and say, is there anything, brother, that you'd like to show me that you did for Jesus while on earth? And the second thing he'll say is, uh, did you love everybody, in, even in spite of themselves and in spite of things, on like this man and uh, the world about us? Fading fancy. You'll soon begin to realize what the eternal weights of glory are all about, after all. Hallelujah. Getting at the judgment seat only means the, the display and the passing out of rewards, that's all. Somebody, we preached on this, I think, the first night. Every wedding I ever went to, not everybody there was the bride. Ouch. Mm. 
there were some bridesmaids, there were some friends of the bride, there were some relatives, there were some parents, there were some guests, there were some uh, sightseers, there were some attenders, there was just all kind of different, even the preacher was there. Hello? Don't you want to be surprised? Why, people singing about a cabin in the corner, then their face grows a little when they sing about a mansion in the middle. Then they, they really get the big head and James and John stands up and says, I want the left and right of the throne. And Jesus said, I can't promise you nothing until I get back to heaven and send the Holy Ghost and find out what I'm really doing in the end. And to the Laodicean church, this church age, he told us in Revelation chapter 3, hey, if you only overcome, I found out something. I got a promise, but if you can only overcome, what must overcome? The world, the flesh, and the devil, but you won't handle those three about divine help. If you overcome, I'll grant you to sit with me in my throne. Right smack dab in the middle of the throne with me, you're going to sit, even as I also overcome. Hallelujah. So I guarantee you that there is very of reward in heaven, and the bride is going to be right in the throne. That overcoming company, church triumphant, glorious church without spot, wrinkle, blemish, or any such thing, that's come out from among them, touch not, taste not, and handle not of the unclean thing, and I'll receive you, sir, for the Lord. Or sit in the throne. And then I look on down there, and there's a the little fellow saying, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to dwell in the gates of the wicked. I guess anything's better than hell. But I just don't want to go to heaven by the skin of my teeth. Last time I looked in the mirror, there wasn't any skin on my teeth. I don't want deathbed repentance. I don't want to get saved like a thief on a cross. I'd rather be a thousand years too early than two seconds too late. Am I telling you the truth tonight? Oh, the Canaan's land, he came the first time, and even then he had a marriage. Oh, how much more the second time he comes will there be a marriage? He turned the water into wine. The first miracle we ever did was one of conversion. You know, the first miracle that counts in your life is one of conversion. He changes one thing into another, water into wine, and sinners into saints. Powerless doubters into Holy Ghost-filled believers. Sick bodies into healed bodies. He's always taking something and making something else out of it. But I know that he needs something to do something with, so why don't you... Make yourself available to God tonight. Show up for work and God will use you. Hallelujah. He needs a blind eyed open one. He needs a deaf eared off stop one. And he needs you to fill up the bridal company with. Say hallelujah. Oh, I'm trying to quit this and I can't seem to do it. Who's playing for me real hard? Glory to God. He turned water into wine and here comes his mother and says they have no wine and he says, uh, can't you help? He said, woman, what have I to do with thee? See, he was thinking way off in the future, ahead of himself, for the wine was his blood shed for the world. He said, I haven't started my ministry yet, and here you want me to crucify already. That's what he was thinking of. He said, woman, what have I to do with thee? But she pacified him and told the servants, whatever he says unto you, don't question it. Do it. I give you the same charge tonight. Whatever he tells you, do it. Don't question it. If he tells you to jump, don't say, Oh, Lord, what will old sister Jones think? If he tells you to jump, you do it. In fact, say, How high, God, do you want me to jump? Say, Amen. He got some empty vessels and he filled them to the top. Come on, you empty vessels. Say, Amen. He's going to fill you to the top. Oh, you getting filled? And then he purified them. Oh, talk about sanctification. That separation for service. He purified them with a firking of peace. I don't know what it'll take to purify you, but he'll work on you, even if it takes hornets to get after some of you Canaanites. He'll purify you one way or the other. And when it filled to the brim and it spilled over, he told the servant to pour out. How many wants to pour out your soul tonight? 
If he filled you, pour out before the Lord and he'll fill you again. Because when you pour out, that's when conversion comes. And when the governor smacks his lips and tastes what you got, he'll say, why, what you got's good for the president too. It's good for the queen. It's good for the king. It's good for anybody on this earth. Water turn the wine. The best wines always last. And it seems like every time the minutes go kicking by in these services, the service gets more intense, deeper, better. Because <laughs> the best wine always lasts. And the later and laster it goes, the better the wine gets. Smack your lips and taste and see with me that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. It tastes just like honey in the walk, honey in the rock, or new wine. Hallelujah. I'm happy. Praising. This was the first miracle we ever did. And the second time he came to Cana, and with this conclusion tonight, I want you to look at a noble man. A very noble person. Oh, thank God for nobility. Ah, uh, you paupers can become princes. Hmm. All you that's been down and out, in and out, and back and forth, and tossed to and fro, you can get established, and God can exalt you in this season. He can edify you tonight. You can receive a little integrity. You can become more noble. A little bit of class. A little bit more taste to some of you Pentecostals. A little bit more character. A little bit more stability. A little more backbone instead of the same old wishbone. Hallelujah. A noble person. I believe that the bride will be made up of nobility. Don't you want to attain a higher level in your Christian character? Say amen. This nobleman walked all the way from Capernaum up, 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 up the mountain to Cana. Cana was on a mountain and Capernaum was way down low. The nobleman walked on foot. And when he came to Jesus, he came on the strength of one miracle. Now remember, he had only turned water into wine and he did it in Cana. And the second time he performed a miracle, it was in Cana again, because he returned the second time to Cana's land. Is he coming back again? He ever came once, he's going to come again. First time he came to suffer, bleed, and die, but this time to reign and to rule forever. He's coming back to earth again. Satan will be bound a thousand years, will have no attempt to then, when my Savior shall come back to earth again. He walked all the way on the strength of one miracle. Jesus had only turned water into wine. He hadn't even healed the first person yet. But that didn't say he was a noble man. Too much class. He knew if God could uh, create wine out of water, wouldn't be no problem to be the first one in the healing line. One miracle. Why, some of you folks couldn't even say praise the Lord until you've seen about 15 miracles. Not this noble man, no sir. He walked on foot all these miles up a hard rugged mountain. But he came to Canaan and said, Lord, have mercy upon my son for he's at the point of death. Might be a good thing for you to get at the point of death tonight. It makes you look at the world in two different eyes. Why don't you die out right now and see if God don't revive and resurrect you and make you new. Crucify your old flesh and see if you don't rise to newness of life in this very meeting. Except you see signs and wonders, you won't believe, said Jesus. That's not a case of seeing signs and wonders, said the noble man. I'm too noble to be chasing after miracles. I'm seeking you, Jesus. You're my only hope. It's a case of life or death. And when you begin to realize that this gospel is not play church, this is a case of life or death. You're either going to heaven or you're going to hell. I don't, I don't preach like that. They don't preach like that anymore, Brother Freddy. Maybe they don't. But the books never change. It's a case of life or death. We're either going to glory or we're going to the hot place. I don't know no middle ground where you can pray Uncle John out two inches at a time. Burn all the candles you want to. Once you leave the body, you're in that particular state nature frozen condition you can't change your nature once out of the body 
You're in eternity now. Timelessness. World without end. What you are is what you be forever and forever. Age upon age. Hello? Over to God. It's life or death. And when Jesus found out he was serious and meant business and it was life or death, he said, I'll come down and heal him. Oh, don't you want Jesus to come down and heal you tonight? I feel him coming down right now. Wave your hand if you feel something moving down from the glory world. Oh, wonderful, said the noble man. Wonderful. Jesus will walk home with me now and heal my son. But Jesus said, walk home alone. But that nobleman didn't pout, doubt, nor do without. He didn't get up the myth tree and mad at Jesus. He said, hmm, he promised, he promised, and he didn't come through with his promise. He was too noble. He walked home by himself knowing that whatever Jesus said would be. On the strength of one miracle, water into wine, and that not even healing, that conversion is dead. He knew that he was the first case of healing in Jesus' three and a half year ministry, but he accepted it. Down, down, down he walked. Back to Capernaum. Had a sinking, low-down feeling in his spirit, but he believed him. He believed Christ anyhow, because he said so. He was too noble to doubt. Halfway home, the servants met him and shouted to victory and said, Brother, nobleman, son is alive and he's living. He mended yesterday at the seventh hour. And the nobleman knew it was the same moment Jesus said he's made home. Oh, for nobility. A higher class. Oh, Canaan. Canaan's land is not over with yet. You can be a Canaanite with no guile. You can be a Canaanite that gets invited to the marriage. And you can become a Canaanite that will become a nobleman and believe God for anything, no matter what the critics say, if you want to be tonight. Or you can be the Canaanites that God has to send the hornets after to clean the land up from. Brother, there's two classes of people on earth, the saved and the unsaved. Those that are redeemed and those that are damned. But I want you to know tonight I'm a different kind of Canaanite. I live in Canaan, I admit it. But I also admit this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. I'm only a pilgrim. Here I have no continuing city, no certain dwelling place. And because I have vowed that I have no home here. He has vowed to me I've got a home over there. God, for this cause, hath prepared for us a city, for he's not ashamed now to be called our God. Hallelujah. And we're not ashamed to say we're soon leaving Canaan, but we're not leaving because the hornets are stinging us in the wrong places. We're not leaving mad because the preacher uh, upset a hornet's nest over our head in his preaching. We're leaving Canaan because we have no guile. We're leaving Canaan because we've been called to the marriage. Because at the marriage is where conversion takes place. In fact, to get to this marriage, you've got to have conversion before you even reach the end of it. And every bit of it gets better as it goes along. We're leaving Canaan because we're no man. We've got a little class. Holy Ghost culture to us now. We've been absorbed in God's word. Come on, all you Canaanites, say a great big amen. If there's any Canaanites left here tonight that needs to become noble or get rid of their guile or called to the marriage, oh God, sing them good. Send hornets all through their hair. Hallelujah. Whoa, God, do something in Cana tonight. If you have to force them and drive them, at least it won't be against their will. But I'd rather by my own choice be without guile, be noble, and be called to the marriage supper table. Put up your hand and thank God you're a Canaanite. Say <laughs> amen. Well, praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Thank you, Jesus. Glory be to God. I love you, Jesus. I'm happy. Oh, glory. Aren't you glad it's Friday night? Brother Freddy's all done preaching. I saw three hands was glad I was done preaching. <laughs> Careful what you say amen to around here. Oh, word of the Lord. God will confirm his word tonight if this be the message of the hour. You believe he will. How many guileless, noble, called to the marriage Canaanites are getting ready for God's best right now? Oh, I hope I don't have to send a few hornets after some that's not getting ready, but 
Irregardless, you're human, you're earthlings, and you're in Cana. I'm just the right class of Canaanite. How about you? I hear you better. Open your heart and let Jesus in. He will remove each burden of sin. Oh, Jesus wants to be your dearest, sweetest friend. Why can't you open your heart tonight? Let his word in. Oh, take, take his hand. Take his name, God hand. Oh, and Jesus will show you the way. He may not have your way again. You must open your heart tonight and let his word in. And let him come in. I'm praying my first prayer of faith right now. And it's for every Canaanite. Hmm. We're all Canaanites tonight in the message, whether we like it or not. We just pray that we're the right kind of a Canaanite. If there's anybody here tonight that feels like you're a day late and a dollar short, always in the right place at the wrong time or in the wrong place at the right time. In fact, not even convinced that you're in the place of God where you ought to be by now at this stage and point in here of your life. Maybe you need a little prod. Maybe God's put a bug in your ear. Maybe he's sent a little hornet by way of this message to say, Hey Canaanites, it's time to get noble. Hey Canaanite, it's time to get shed of all your guile. Hey Canaanite, it's time for you to get invited and know that you've got a specially engraved invitation to the married supper table of the Lamb, which is the rapture of the church. We're all Canaanites, whether we like it or not, but I want us to all be Canaanites that we like. Hallelujah. I'm praying my first prayer. Every honest person tonight, needing prayer for the soul, deeper spirituality, wanting to know that you're a Canaanite with no guile, noble and going to a wedding. I want you to stand for my first prayer of many prayers, but this is my first prayer tonight. All over this place, stand and get up here and see God kind of sending hornets after people. Lord, if they don't get out of that chair, sing them right where they sit. That's what I say. Hallelujah. Every Canaanite, you want to be a Canaanite indeed, in whom there is no guile, and whom there is nobleness and noble blood flowing. Whom is knowing you're going to the marriage, the wedding feast? There's a few more I'll be saying. You can rest assured that you're not really where you ought to be. Wasn't that the problem with the Canaanites? They, they were where they had not to be. God had to move them on a little bit. God had a place for Canaanites. It just wasn't in the kosher land of Canaan. Don't you want to find that place in God? If you're not where you once was in God, you need this prayer. If you've held your own even, you need this prayer, let alone if you slid back a little. If you're not where you once was in deeper, I need to pray for you. And I give two altar calls every night. The first one's by invitation. The second one is by ear. I go and get them by the ear. If I was you, I'd rise, come the easy way, remember? Don't get stung in a hospital room or lose everything you got before you finally come into the perfect will of God again. Rise and get in his perfect will, all ye Canaanites tonight. 
rise and get in his perfect will. I'm tired of you living in the permissive will and some place that God puts up with when you can have God's best. Canaanites, you better stand or God is going to start stinging you to your feet right now. Hallelujah. You feel the sting of what I'm saying? That's you. Rise, old Canaanite. God's got a new place, a better place for you. And that place may not be in Canaan's land, but it'll certainly be in a land where there's no guile well, you're noble, go into a wedding, then he'll take you back to Jerusalem after Babylon. Back to Jerusalem after Babylon's all over with. Thank God. Come back to the perfect. Get rid of the permissive. Hallelujah. Well, this is my first prayer of faith and my first altar call. I warn you, I'll be coming and praying for some of you by ear before I'm through. Get in your seat. I trust that the only reason you're in your chair is because you don't need this prayer. I refuse to allow any other category than those that need this prayer and those that don't. And those that need this prayer be on your feet. And how I'll know that you that's in your seat qualified to be in your seat, you'll be praying for those who are on their feet. I don't pray alone. The only reason you have a right to sit in that chair it's because you are where you need to be in God. You are without guile. You are the nobleman God wants you to be. You are on your way to the wedding feast. You know that beyond a shadow of a doubt. Otherwise, on your feet. Or if you stay in your seat, stay praying for those who are standing. Hallelujah. All right? Now that puts it pretty plain. And a few more have stood. You that's on your feet, lift your hands up over your head. We're going to pray. I'm going to pray. And every seated person tonight will be praying for you too. Some of them, that's too much pressure, preacher. Wait till you get at the judgment. See what kind of pressure is going to be there. You either is or you ain't. Some of them, I don't want to go to the judgment. Why not come tonight and practice up? This is a mini judgment. You need to practice that you're all going to stand before the last judgment. Hallelujah to God. Lift your hand up high. Now everybody in your chair. Take the praying with me right now. Go ahead and pray. Pray for these that's on their feet. You're in a position to pray. Let me not only feel you, but let me hear you praying. Lord of God. Lord Jesus, I pray for these who are standing. Lord, restore the soul. Save it if it needs saving. Or put it in the place where it belongs if it's sort of out of line and out of whack and out of kilter. Lord, don't let it be in the right place at the wrong time, wrong place at the right time, but in the right place at the right time, place every standing person in the perfect will, the dead center of your perfect will. Stir the hearts and the souls right now, purge out the dross, take away the guile. Oh God, take away uh, the uh, baseness, the spirit of the sons of Belial. Take away anything that is not noble, but contrary to nobility. Take it away. Make them noblemen, princes and princesses, kings and queens, heirs and joint heirs. Hallelujah. Oh, God, stamp upon them now that engraved upon their heart invitation to go to the feast, the wedding supper. Hallelujah to God. Let it be part of the bride and the raptured company. Lord, let it happen, should you come tonight, that you take them. And I believe if you come right now, you would take those who are standing. And you are coming. I know you're coming. Because you came to Cana the first time. And then you came to Cana the second time, too. If you ever did it once, you can do it again. And it's about to happen once more. This is that generation. Lord, worship the Lord, all ye in your chairs. All you on your feet. Thank God for where he put you and how he placed you even at this moment tonight. Glory. Hallelujah. I thank you, Jesus, for touching these lives. Let every soul be joined unto you. Let every spirit be rejuvenated. Every sanctified be sanctified. And let every one of them that's been out of sorts, disgruntled, put them where they ought to be. Lord, those that flew off the hand of the day and lost their temper and those that's condemned and under conviction, God, make them noble without guile and in the marriage. Hallelujah. Put them there. 
for they are now Canaanites indeed. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, it seemed like before tonight, all we ever heard about Canaanites was bad things. But now I found a bunch of Canaanites that's full of good things, all full of nobility, lost their guile, headed for the wedding in the sky. Hallelujah to God. Good Canaanites. Everybody, let's thank God. There's only one that's good, that's God, and he's made you better. Hallelujah. Better than you are. Glorious, glorious to God. Wonderful, wonderful Jesus. Go ahead and rejoice. I feel like I'm doing most of the praying here. I don't want to do that. You that's on your feet can rejoice with those who are in their seat. For you're all one bunch of Canaanites now. You're all the same bunch of Canaanites. Go ahead and praise it. Rejoice all over this building. Hallelujah. You have made the twain one both the same. Middle all partition broken down. Oh, the same Lord over all is rich on all who call tonight. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Wonderful, wonderful Lord. Oh, glory, glory be to God. Thank God, thank God. Stay right where you're at and sing one time through this chorus. Maybe better do an F. I don't know if they can reach the fire if I go. Our Lord is coming back to earth again. Our Lord is coming back to earth again. Satan will be bound. A thousand years will have no tempted then. When Jesus shall come back to earth again. Sing it this way. Our Lord is coming back to Canaan's land. Our Lord is coming back to Canaan's land. Satan will be found. A thousand years will have no tempted then. When our Lord is coming back to Canaan's land. He ever came once, he'll come again. The first time he did his first miracle, turn water to wine, the miracle of conversion. But the second time he came, he made noblemen out of those who made the long pilgrim journey. How many noblemen are here? Going to a marriage without any guile at all. Hallelujah. Three times Cana was referred to in the New Testament. We've covered tonight. And look what God did as a result of preaching that message of the hour. You that's standing, I'm as feeling like a real, true Canaanite. Hallelujah. That's wonderful. Boy, well, you can do what you want to, be seated or remain standing, but stay in the Spirit. Stay in the Spirit. We're going on now and pray for a few more. It's Friday night. There's not a blessed thing going on in Tampa right now. Oh, there's lots of things going on, but they're not blessed. Now, people that would rather stay home and watch TV because it's phony and it's not real. Hmm? Say amen. Hallelujah. They'd be scared to death to come out here and watch reality. I remember one time I went to the Passion Play in Lake Wales and there was big shots from New York sucking on cigars, sweating gallons of sweat every time the actor went around and healed the sick. You know what the Passion Play is? How many knows what that is? It's a play in Lake Wales where they reenact the life of Christ. And I could just hear them sweating. Oh, whew, thank God this ain't real. Thank God that ain't. That scares me. Thank God this ain't real. But it scared me that it wasn't real. You know where, I, where I'm coming from, don't you? <laughs> Hallelujah to God. All that was was play acting. It was scaring those big shots to death. Brother, I believe if the real thing ever hit him, it'd probably knock him dead. Oh, glory, aren't you happy? I love you, Jesus. Glory to God. They brought Dad in here tonight to be healed. And he may be the toughest case in this place, but who cares? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Hey, man, we'll tackle anything. If you've got a tumor on you as big as a tub, we'll at least tackle it. And we're not scared to pray for anything or anyone. What did the doctor tell you, Dad? I haven't been to a doctor for a good many years. And for them. Okay. And heart trouble. You're going downhill pretty bad. I have been for them. That's what she said. Yes. I don't hear you either. Well, Dad needs a general overhaul is what he needs. Hallelujah to God. Blessed be the Lord. Thank God. Would you stand up now for us? 
he stood up pretty easily. Now, maybe no doctor has told him anything, but this doctor is about to tell him something. If Jesus don't heal him, he's not long for this world. Hallelujah. We're going to pray that God will give you a general over home. Thank you. Thank you. We're also going to pray that God will deliver you of a habit in your life. Looks to me like it comes in a bottle or a can or some kind of a drinking. Hallelujah. You was raised in Kentucky. Well, that's, that's a half a way of an excuse. That's only half an excuse. Hallelujah. Amen. We drunk twice in my life. And never again. I see. Well, even so, God don't want you touching any of it. Whether you get drunk or you don't get drunk. He wants you free of the bottle. And then the third thing we're going to pray for Dad for is in your soul. That God will restore your soul. If you never got anything else, you better get that thing straightened out. Hallelujah. You remember the man I preached on the night that gave his life to God at age 80? No life left. Hallelujah. Step of faith. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. touch my body. Touch my body. Heal me tonight. Heal me, please. Take my habits away, too. Take my habits away, too. Don't let me touch another drop. Don't let me touch another... Another drop. drop. Another drop. Or take another drink. What does that mean? Or take another drink. Or take another drink. Hallelujah. Save my soul. Save my soul. Wash me in the blood. Wash me in the blood. Put my name in heaven's book. Put my name in heaven's book. Come in my life to save. Come in my life to save. I believe you heard me. I believe you heard me. Something new is in my soul. Something new is in my soul. I feel Jesus in my heart. I put Jesus in my heart. He was already there. Well, he's there without getting drunk now. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus. We must come your way, and now that we have, we pray that you loosen this tough nut to crack, this hard case to an act to follow, this body that needs a general overhaul. So many things he needs tonight, and everybody in that same chair rejoiced in the same way. Oh, God. And emphysema leaves his chest and both lungs. He could throw that my hand rush. Hallelujah. Grammy over here is wanting him healed so bad. Want him healed almost worse than he does. Lord Jesus, let the dying soul blind. Let the dying soul blind. Let the dying soul blind. I just had all I could do was get to his feet a moment ago. I got him walking around this place right now. His ears came up and he said, Hallelujah to God. Oh, uh, take a deep breath now. Uh, 
You feel any smothering in your chest? No, no more so than usual, no. Uh, uh, the upper part of my lungs are not as active as it should be with them in. Of course. And you're breathing a little deeper now. Breathing what? You're, you're breathing a little deeper and easier in your chest? I hope so, yes. Yeah. Well, try it again. Let's see. I have a little pain. A little pain, huh? Yeah. Your it could be hard, too. It was hard. We prayed for your heart. You didn't forget that we prayed for your heart. No, I'm glad of that. Mm-hmm. Raised in Kentucky or no Kentucky, Jesus has done something for him now. Your ears are louder. They are. Sometimes, sometimes he will repeat from a force of habit. He will repeat himself because he's been this way a long while. Yes, my ears are better. His ears are better. Look at the people now and see if they look any brighter to your eyes. The friendly ones are waving. I can't say that, but look. Well, look, before you say anything, look. Hey. Hands are waving? <laughs> sure. You see the hands waving? I see the hands waving. They've come a little bit brighter to your eyes. Yes, now wave back at them. Yeah. I love everybody. Now, I hate nobody. Feel in your side now and see what happened in your side. That I do not detect. You don't detect it? No. My side I thought was all right. Check it real good. Lord of God. Grammy's helping him now. She wants this done. She wants this work done. Oh, there go. You see, our load is like, Doctor, I hate nobody. Uh, I know you don't, because Jesus just came in your heart when tonight, Dad. you somebody, you have a load on your shoulders, I think. That's right. I've been raised a Christian. Mm-hmm. Now that old habit's gone, too. Yes, the habit's gone, too. Yes, it wasn't too bad, start with. Well, I know, but any, any bit bad enough. One is bad enough, huh? Uh huh. Hey. Okay. Why? Well, you feel Jesus come in your heart, and, and he's not reeling from that, just, you know, that uh, oh, intoxication. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Glory to God. See you once more around your belt and see how that is. You don't feel no hernia. No. Oh, yes. <laughs> That's down here, though. Uh-huh. Well, it's not hurting you now. No, it's not hurting me, but I know it's there. But I'll tell you this much. Will you check on it when you get home? Yes, I will. When you're getting private, you check on it. Cause I will. I believe it's shrunk down smaller already. I hope so. Just, just say, I know so. I uh, know so. That's faith. Yeah. Hope so is speculation. God bless you, Dad. You're gonna live. You're gonna live all your days now. He's gonna live longer now. God bless you. Yeah, God bless you. He's getting strong and witty and everything else now. I told you he's the toughest case in this place. But we just might as well start with that to begin with. From now on, it'll be easy. Say hallelujah. Oh, you're happy. Say I love you, Jesus. Oh, glory to God. One more time, worship and adore Him. All bow down before him. Jesus, the Lamb of God. Hallelujah to God. Glory to God. Thank God. My sister right there, stand. Let God touch you tonight. Hold your hands up to him. Glory to God. First thing God's doing for you right now is in your circulation. Poor circulation. It's being healed. It's speeding up, flowing, circulating all through your body. Hallelujah to God. There's been a little weight over your chest. Over your chest. More so on the left side here. Right around the air of your heart. God's healing your heart tonight. Should I stop there or pray for everything? Pray for everything, all right. You told me to. Thirdly, a dryness lingers by times in your throat here. Like a string 
sticking down your throat. Amen. Hold steady and we'll get that. There it goes. That's gone. Thank the Lord. One more thing, my sister. No, there's two more things. I would be happy to pray for one and quit, but then she won't get it all if we don't pray for it all. Funny thing about prayer, you only get what you ask for. Hallelujah. They do your stomach, the digestive, digestive area of your stomach. God is going to quicken it. Hallelujah. The food you eat will digest right through the large colon. There's a purging occurring and taking place. It's open. The blockage is removed. One other thing, because of your poor circulation, you've had some stiffness starting in your joint. In your joint. I want you to understand it began with poor circulation. Lots of folks with arthritis first began with poor circulation. Yes, it did. And now God touches his joint. Lucius and heals with honey. Throat is open. God and our daughter is free from digestive blockages. It's healed and flowing again. Now every joint be oiled with the oil of gladness. Hallelujah. Thank God it's done. Oh, let it go. Well, if God will take it from that joint, I'll feel assured that the arthritis has left every part of your body. Now bend it. Loosen it up. Man. Is that hurting there now? Come on, you praisers. Don't be sightseers. Be praisers. Praise makes perfect, and perfection comes through praise. If I'm not going real speedy, I always look back at the congregation, find out why they're not going speedy with me. Hallelujah. The Lord Jesus, let this be loosened. And now praise makes perfect. There wasn't much pain left, and that wasn't much praise, but that should have done it. That should have done the trick, right there. Should be, should be finished. Glory to God. Oh, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Well, don't forget to answer me, Grammy. Hallelujah. Much better. Much better. So we, just, we say we can't have church without you. I mean, things won't be perfect without your worshiping and thanksgiving. Hallelujah. Say, do something for me. Uh, do two things tonight. Eat something you like before you go to bed. It'll digest real well. You won't feel any binding to here. Okay? I'll do that. Second thing, sleep on this side tonight. All night long, sleep on this side. Okay? And when you don't feel anything going numb and bothering you with pain, you'll know that the heart is healed. The heart is healed. Glory to God. Swallow, see how your throat feels. The dinosaurs is from it. Praise God. Well, God bless you.